On the 1st of January 2013, the Federal Cabinet records of 1984 and 1985 were released to the public. These documents provide interesting insights into the inner workings of government and reveal much about the social, political and economic debates of the time. Historian Dr Jim Stokes told journalists about those records in a special embargoed media briefing in early December 2012. Former Senator Susan Ryan also spoke to the press. The early 1980s was a time of significant change for Australia. 1984 to 85 saw the first ever televised election debate and federal budget release. The $1 coin was introduced and Melbourne celebrated its 150th anniversary. Advance Australia Fair was announced as Australia's official national anthem and green and gold selected as our national colours. In 1984, Australia's Prime Minister Bob Hawke was enjoying immense popularity with a 70% public approval rating as the new government set about tackling major issues in a way that sought to achieve community consensus. In stark contrast, Opposition leader Andrew Peacock was facing an uncertain hold on the Liberal Party leadership and a low 36% public approval rating. The 1983 election, which had brought Hawke to power, was a double dissolution of both Houses of Parliament, requiring another election no later than the first half of 1985. Hawke once again had a comfortable victory at the election held on the 1st of December 1984. On the 5th of September 1985, the long-running tensions between Andrew Peacock and John Howard came to a head when Peacock resigned the Liberal Party leadership and Howard replaced him. I naturally um, assume uh, this job in slightly unexpected circumstances. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I assume it with enormous uh, enthusiasm. I'm excited about the prospects of presenting the Liberal Party as a clear distinct alternative to the Labor Party. Once the December 1984 election was over, Cabinet set an ambitious agenda for fiscal reform. On the 13th of December, Treasurer Paul Keating told Cabinet that the government must maintain its record of sound economic management, which had clearly contributed to the election victory. Since the Hawke government took power, there had been rapid growth in employment, a reduction in inflation and interest rates, and an improved investment outlook. However, it was now time to reduce the budget deficit. Keating saw the major policy issues of 1985 as the need to restrain expenditure to relieve pressure on borrowing and interest rates, to maintain consensus on wage and price restraint, and to reform the tax system. I believe that there is an inevitability associated with the fact that we have to do something about the income tax system. It is rotten. It needs to be fixed. During 1984-85, the ACTU demanded substantial income tax relief for low- and middle-income earners to ensure the survival of the prices and incomes accord. Cabinet considered a range of options for reducing personal income tax, however there was no easy way of achieving this. Inflation had resulted in taxpayers who received only average weekly earnings paying a marginal tax rate of 46 cents in the dollar. 44% of taxpayers were in the lower or middle income groups, so that even a modest reduction in their tax obligation would result in a substantial loss of revenue. This loss could not be recouped from high income earners because there were not enough of them. The Prime Minister's election commitment to hold a national tax summit generated a formidable volume of work for Cabinet and Treasury. Treasury and Keating fought passionately for the introduction of a broad-based consumption tax although the Prime Minister's office became increasingly uneasy about its political consequences. The tax summit, held in Canberra in the first week of July, confirmed that a consumption tax would be opposed by a wide range of interests, including the trade unions, the welfare lobby, business groups and both right and left-wing politicians. Cabinet formally buried the consumption tax on the 12th of August 1985, noting Treasury advice that revenue from a tax on services and a major extension of wholesale sales taxes would be insufficient to fund compensation for low-income earners and to make a satisfactory contribution to cuts in income tax. Keating unveiled the final tax package in the House of Representatives on the 19th of September. Despite the loss of the consumption tax, the package included a wide range of reforms. There were to be new taxes on fringe benefits and capital gains, 
The wholesale sales tax was to be streamlined, and the tax provisions in areas such as farm losses, water conservation, forestry and film production were to be tightened. In 1981, the Fraser government had agreed to a US request to land two unarmed MX intercontinental ballistic missiles in the Tasman Sea, some 220 kilometres east of Tasmania. Prime Minister Hawke confirmed Australia's agreement to the test firing plan when visiting Washington in 1983. It was a sensitive issue at a time when there was substantial opposition in Australia to the nuclear arms race. An estimated 250,000 people took part in the Palm Sunday peace marches in April 1984, and the Nuclear Disarmament Party gained 7% of the vote in the December election. On the 29th of January 1985, Cabinet decided that if the government was required to explain its position on the MX tests, it would confirm publicly that the agreement would be honoured, but only after the Prime Minister had secured US agreement to transferring the splashdown zone out of the Australian Exclusive Economic Zone into international waters. The Prime Minister would tell the US when he was in Washington the following week that Australia's previous commitment to provide assistance would not constitute a precedent and that any further request would require consultation with the South Pacific Forum. The government announced on the 1st of February that US planes monitoring the missile splashdown in the Tasman Sea would be allowed to land in Australia, precipitating considerable public controversy. However, after meeting with Hawke on the 6th of February, US Secretary of State George Shultz announced that the test would be conducted without the use of Australian support facilities. In February 1984, the Age newspaper published material from unauthorised tape recordings of telephone calls allegedly made by the New South Wales Police. The tapes related to a range of possible criminal activities, including the insinuation that Commonwealth Judge Justice Lionel Murphy of the High Court might have acted improperly in attempting to influence court proceedings relating to his friend Sydney solicitor Morgan Ryan. Director of Public Prosecutions Ian Temby QC was asked to investigate the material to identify any possible federal offences. It's certainly not to be taken for granted that the truth will be ascertained and charges laid against the perpetrators of what appears to be a sustained conspiracy to break the law. This precipitated more than two years of inquiries and legal proceedings. However, Temby reported that the voices on the tapes could not be authenticated and that there was no evidence of offences under federal law to warrant charges or further investigations. Evidence presented to the inquiry included allegations by New South Wales Chief Magistrate Clarence Breeze about Murphy's involvement in the Morgan Ryan case. The inquiry divided on party lines. However, it was decided that it had not been proved that any conduct of Murphy constituted misbehaviour under Section 72 of the Constitution. When on the 3rd of September 1984, Cabinet asked the Senate Committee to refer the Breeze evidence to the Department of Public Prosecutions, the Senate decided to resume committee hearings, this time in public. Breeze and two other New South Wales judges gave evidence about apparent attempts to influence proceedings in favour of Morgan Ryan. Murphy chose not to give evidence. A majority of the committee found that on the balance of probability, Murphy had attempted to pervert the course of justice over the Ryan committal, and the DPP decided to press charges. In July 1985, he was convicted on one of two counts and sentenced to 18 months imprisonment. His conviction was subsequently overturned and he was acquitted in April 1986. However, by this time, he was suffering from inoperable cancer and was unable to return to the High Court. On the 16th of April 1984, Cabinet agreed to the tabling of a green paper on affirmative action and the establishment of a working party chaired by Senator Susan Ryan to plan its implementation. In a joint submission, Senators Ryan and Gareth Evans noted the ALP's commitment to take all administrative and legislative steps, including the introduction of affirmative action programs, to ensure equality for women. The Sex Discrimination Act, which was approved by Parliament in March 1984, outlawed discrimination on the grounds of sex, marital status or pregnancy. However, it did not compel the breaking down of occupational segregation or improvement to the representation of women in all areas. The Green Paper recommended immediate legislation to establish affirmative action programs for women and disadvantaged minority groups in the Australian Public Service.